All right, so uh, let's get started as people trickle in, uh, braving the cold uh, from <laughs> far away, Mary Grayton Center, all the way to the mud box. Thanks so much for joining us here. Um, we uh, put together a panel on uh, student engagement in the online classroom. And uh, what brought us to this topic is that, of course, student engagement um, is, is, is really a centerpiece uh, in the online classroom because especially when you teach uh, parts of it or all of it asynchronously, um, the student engagement is what makes the class happening, you know, um, uh, other than lectures or feeding them, readings, etc. So we felt like it was really worth um, uh, uh, devoting a topic to that particular aspect of online teaching. Uh, not to say that any one of us are, are experts, maybe aside from Laura, um, but we all have experience um, and first-hand experience with online teaching, so we'd be willing to share some of that with you, hoping that you then also uh, give us some feedback and maybe share your experiences with us towards the end. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Laura, who will kick us off, and we have sort of an order um, uh, along the way that we predefined to convey what we had to convey and then have enough time to debate. Sure. Hi. Well. Uh, my name is Laura March. I'm an instructional designer over at CTRL, the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning at AU. Please come stop by my office. It's in the second floor of Hearst. If you can't get up there, we can meet in the quad or whatever you'd like to do. Um, I guess I'd like to start off by just introducing myself and how I got to this position right here. Uh, because in a previous life, I was actually a web designer, and I went back to graduate school because I was interested in making creative experiences accessible for differently abled students. And in the way, I found that much of my arts education classes that were offered online or in hybrid versions were horrible. They were just terrible classes, especially compared with the in-person versions taught by the same instructors, which really made me interested in instructional design and instructional systems as a concept. And so I picked up a second degree in uh, instructional systems, which is all about designing educational experiences that make learning more effective and efficient and appealing. Uh, my job here at AU is to train and certify new online instructors and make sure that they get the support that they need to make an engaging and effective course and Andrew I guess can tell you more about that he just completed our, our fall version we're gonna be starting our spring version next week um, so I have a few best practices handouts from the course here if you'd like to take some for your own um, also if you'd like to take the class or just come and get in touch with me about your own coursework get in touch I've got business cards here and I'd just love to chat and AU is extremely rare in that it provides training for teachers to make sure that their classes and their instructors are held to really the highest standards before the class even runs. And it's important to know that those online classes carry the same credit and name. So uh, it just needs to be as rigorous and fulfilling as the online, as the in-person classes. So online, hybrid, in-person, it really doesn't make a difference on their transcript. They really need to be getting those same experiences. And so before we get really started, I think it's important to know what we're working with time-wise. And these are AU's credit guidelines. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with these. Um, and they follow the, the Carnegie classification of what a credit hour actually is. So if your regular three credit online class down here ever gets audited by middle states or another body, uh, you really have to prove that you're providing at least two and a half hours of instruction and five hours of student work for a regular each week for a regular three credit class in a, in a 15 week semester. So moving that on to kind of the meat of this presentation, the way I see this topic as an instructional designer is that there are really three types of engagement, the student to course content, student to instructor, and students to each other, that peer engagement. And to start, Decades of research and literature indicate that in order to learn, students must do a whole lot more than just listen. They have to write, discuss, or be engaged in some sort of problem-solving activity, which is called active learning. And it's a whole lot more engaging to do something with the course content than really just listen to a talking head speak to you from a screen. And I challenge you to go even further and make your course content authentic, which means that you focus on real-world problems and projects that are actually relevant to your learners um, and that professionals in your field actually practice. So try to explore and discuss and meaningfully construct uh, some concepts and relationships within specific contexts. So this could be anything from mock debates to policy briefs, case studies, creating white papers, or maybe making scholarly articles that actually follow the journalistic guidelines that they could submit after the class was done. 
So those are some kind of strategies to use, but it's helpful to figure out where to start at the very beginning. And that's where learning outcomes comes into play. And learning outcomes really focuses your course content and activities and assessment on what you think is important. So if by the end of your semester you want your students to have like, memorized the periodic table of elements, then that's a different outcome than being able to explain how the periodic table of elements is set up and why certain elements function the way they do and how that info is used by a chemist today. So a memorization outcome would be maybe like students would be able to fill out a blank periodic table with elements name, symbol, and atomic number, which is fine, but it's very low level. And in contrast, a more active and authentic outcome would be something like explain the structure of the periodic table and what each part means, plus how those are used by chemists today and compare and contrast different areas of the table. So I don't know about you, but the second version seems a whole lot more engaging than, than the first. And that's just engaging within the, the course content, taking you and taking the peers out of it to begin with. So the same could be said for history. You could either memorize dates of wars or uh, focus on an outcome that would be maybe arguing the causes of a conflict or what a student would do if they were in a position of the power to resolve a war more quickly or what, what could have been done in argument and debate around, around that sort of idea. So if you have those outcomes already created, they'll direct what type of instructional environment you'd like to create. Which brings me to the actual personal inter interaction that you'll have with your students, which is incredibly important. So why not make one of your office hours actually mandatory? And students could sign up to uh, Skype or Google Hangout with you, video chat with you at the beginning of the class, or walk into campus if you're in your office, if you're both on campus. And it will help solidify uh, an engaging connection that will really kind of make you less scary if they have help. So they need, they need some help, they don't know how to contact you, they've already met you at the beginning of the class, it doesn't seem to be such a barrier to get in touch with you later. So another strategy is just using a non-graded quiz or a simple Google survey to find out what they're interested in, to find out what your students want out of the course. And you can emphasize that specific content, call out specific students, or even make separate readings or group them together on, on certain topics that fall under your big course goals. And I recommend being incredibly clear on your syllabus about your personal contact information and specify the best method to get in touch with you. Is it email? Is it text? Is it video chat? And for those office hours, Make sure you actually include what your Skype name is or what your Google Hangout ID name is. Um, a major, another major important area is to share your average response time, and this will really help mitigate any of those really worried students that email you at midnight and expect you to respond by 6 o'clock the next morning. Just put out your expectations and everybody will know and feel a little bit calmed about what they should be expecting as a, as a student in your class. And another side note about that feedback loop, so you really need to provide feedback on assignments and specifically weekly work if you're having ongoing assignments before the next one is due. So students know if they're uh, successful. And this is incredibly important for discussion boards. If you have a weekly discussion board, you really need to give feedback before the next weekly discussion board um, actually is, is due. So the students know what they need to change in order to reach your expectations. And it really shows that you're engaged in their learning process. If you're kind of step back, you don't let them know that they've been successful, then you're really not engaged in their learning process. You're not helping them move to the next level. Um, so I, rem I recommend blocking out some time in your schedule. Just use your phone. Make a, make a calendar appointment each week if you have a weekly assignment. Block out an hour, two hours, and I'm, I'm sure some of our other presenters will share what they do and how, how long it takes them for uh, getting through each of those kind of assignments. So also through research, we know that students have a very, very limited attention pan, span, and sitting through pre-recorded video lectures for 30 and 40 and 60 minutes just doesn't work. And the vast majority, we're talking about 85% of students will stop watching your lecture after five minutes. And that's not to say that you shouldn't make them, but try chunking them into five minute sections. So a 15 minute video, will nobody will watch past the five minute mark, but three five minute videos will do the trick. And I know, I know it's strange, it's just making things easier to, to accomplish. Um, so you could do maybe two or three slides per lecture and then that's how you would chunk it. Um, another recommendation is making two types of videos, one being evergreen that you could use for a couple of semesters and one being uh, 
new or fresh that relates specifically to those interests that you may be gauged at the beginning of the semester, or um, even feedback to students directly. So you can give feedback on their assignments through a video, which is incredibly easy now through the blue back Blackboard system. The new Blackboard system has a link up with your YouTube or Gmail account, and you can create lectures right through the camera on your laptop screen or the camera on your phone. Give feedback, it'll be made directly into your Blackboard account. And I'd recommend making a whole separate Gmail account just for your classes here so you don't get any mix-up between your personal videos or anything you have on the side and those uh, Blackboard-connected videos that'll show up on your Blackboard course site. And they're offering kind of how-tos throughout the day through the Ampharian Conference, and you can always stop by the Blackboard office. They're open nine to five weekdays in the third floor of this building. So moving on to peer engagement, I kind of like to start by asking how many people here actually really loved working in a group, really loved group projects when they were a student? Mm. <laughs> like love, the, you really wanted to, to be a part of them. So I say let's treat students the way that ourselves would like to be, we'd like to be treated. Um, so unless you really have a learning outcome that requires collaboration, I'd think twice about those group projects. So if there is an integral part of your course that requires that collaboration, figure out how it would be done in the real world. You'd probably have specific roles and responsibilities. So offer those to your students. Um, not just here's your assignment, here's your group, figure out how to do it. Um, just Allow your students to know how they should perform and assess those accordingly. Otherwise, you're really not assessing the course content. You're kind of assessing how the student functions within a group. And that's not to say that peer engagement is worthless. It's just about matching your outcomes with the activities and assessments that you're using. And so here are a few instructional strategies on the top that align with the action verbs used in your outcomes below. So asking students to teach one another uh, how to create a lesson plan about the course content would really satisfy their ability to explain your course content. If your learning outcome is they'd explain something, like explain how to create a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they could create a lesson outcome on <laughs> a lesson plan on how to make a PB&J. Um, you could have a critique where your students actually have to produce something and then analyze one another's work. So that will help uh, defend their viewpoints. It would help with uh, recommending certain areas. Uh, same thing with debates. Students would need to recommend or defend or analyze certain viewpoints by debating. These, none of these, obviously, are group projects necessarily. You could group them if you wanted to chunk them into uh, maybe groups of four, but they wouldn't, nece wouldn't necessarily need each other uh, for their own specific grade in all these projects. And there's a great website with many more ideas that I've linked to right here. It's the top Google search result when you hit alternatives to lectures that gives 50 ideas uh, that will work in person or online. And I'd love to later, if you'd like to brainstorm together if you're having any trouble with specific outcomes or activities that you'd like to chat about and maybe we can work together and figure out a different kind of way or a different um, approach to getting at those learning outcomes online. So with that being said, I'd like to hand the floor over to Professor Gunther. Okay. Thank you very much, Laura. Okay, I will try to okay, stand over here and present it because I need to see what I wrote actually myself. Okay, uh, I am teaching in the economics department and uh, the topic is enhancing student engagement in the online classroom. And as you all know, an online classroom faces some challenges in student engagement because they are not all present. You can't observe them, what they are doing. So. Uh, however, it can also be an opportunity to have online teaching because uh, students have many more options to engage, to actively participate in an online course than in class because they can do it at their leisure, uh, like if they are at the beach, okay, they can do it while being at the beach, they can actively learn, they can do the readings, they can do the exercises and so on and so forth, and that might be actually an opportunity. Uh, According to Barbara Monroe's Fostering Critical Engagement in Online Discussions, which is, has been the Washington State University study, which has been a training resource provided by American University who told, take the online teaching class at AU, like I did uh, something like two or three years ago. She wrote that this online threaded discussion has often been praised for actually increased student participation rates measured in terms of 
numbers of students participating as well as in terms of numbers of contributions per student. So, but the point is that, you know, it's not just important to have an increased number, but to critically engage students. And the way, what I want to share with you today is basically the lessons or my own experience on a specific course. Uh, this is a tentative lessons from Econ 363 Macroeconomics of Development, which I have taught uh, in summer 2012, in summer 2013, in summer 2014, and I will also teach it in summer 2015. <laughs> so it has evolved a little bit over time, but basically, uh, even though I have little comparisons you know, in terms of participation of students in other online classes, I am very happy with my students' participations, and I just want to basically uh, show you on how I'm doing it. Okay. So first, the first one general lesson which I would like to share with you is that don't expect much particip participation unless you grade it. Okay, if you say, oh, do this on a voluntary basis, it has not worked in my case. So if you want students to participate, you need to give some grading related to that. Otherwise, you know, I had offered to Skype me voluntarily uh, in the first two times and nobody Skyped me ever because it was voluntary. So if you want to have some participation, you need to give a grade for it to some degree. It's a kind of sad that it is like that, but it is a little bit like that. Uh, second, I don't have a midterm uh, nor a final exam in online courses. Instead, the course grade is based on three short research projects. Each count 20% of the course. I have three homework sets, which the best two, they are a little bit difficult, that's why I count only the two best. The two best count each for 10%, and then I have the standard uh, engagement tool, online discussions via Blackboard, which count for another 20%. So these three elements, okay, this is how I engage students and how students are engaged in my class in this course, uh, 363. This is just a grading scale to give you an overview that 60% is a research paper, 20% for homework, and then 20% for online, and then I give grades based on the various points they, they got, they get a grade, and then they get the course uh, grade for that. Okay, now, it's really important to have a, a very well, a very good structure of your online course. That's at least what I, I, I have learned. Uh, I consider the course structure to be important for keeping students involved. Uh, given that at least this course is a seven week course. I have structured the course also in seven weeks. Okay? So this is what it is. Okay, you didn't worry about the details, but they are specific topics like key characteristics and growth, then basic macroeconomic theory, and so on. Every week is one specific topic which is the task for that week and students know about it and they understand it and they say, okay, this week is finished now, we start a new topic and that way I think it is helpful to have it structured that way. You don't need to, but I think it's useful to have it like that. Uh, everything, including for online discussion, is also structured by week. So let me just uh, introduce how I do the online discussions. Uh, they are also structured by week and for maximum online discussion points a student can earn every week is 16. And up to 10 points they can get from substantial contributions and six points they can get for critically commenting on another student's substantial contribution. Uh, for substantial, con substantial contributions are a set of answers, are answers to a set of questions uh, for each class, for each PowerPoint. I have three PowerPoints a week uh, on uh, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and they need to there are a set of questions for each PowerPoint and they need to comment or answer those questions if they want to get credit for a substantial contributions. So the substantial contribution can only be made on Mondays, Wednesdays or Fridays. Okay. But then they have, of course, the possibility to comment. Okay. Comments can be made any time during the week until Saturday. It doesn't have to, and we can comment on a class on Monday what a person has, you know, made a substantial <laughs> contribution on, on Monday or Wednesday or Friday. You can comment uh, on any time during the week with a comment and get credit for a comment. Uh, the contributions and comments are graded then on Sunday and it's then shared with them on how much points they get. So if they see, okay, maybe my contribution was not that good, I didn't get a lot of points for it, or they say, okay, my contribution was good. So Every Sunday they know on how much they have contributed and what I think of their contribution. And that helps them also to, to, to continue to be engaged or to step up their 
engagement if I don't think that your contribution or comment has been really good. Uh, okay, with regards to the homework and the research paper, as I said, they are also weekly. So in addition to the online discussions every week, except the last week, I have students to submit either an answer set, answer, a homework set, answers to the homework set, or a research project. And it's just alternating. I start with a research project, then a homework, research project, homework, research project, homework. So that's how I have organized it. Uh, anyway. So for research projects, uh, each research project is supposed to be about 2,500 words, uh, basically a research paper. Uh, and I have a guidance note provided for each research project so that students get a better idea on what is expected from them. So that they say, what do I need to do? So there is a guidance note for every research paper paper project what, ex was it, what is expected from them. Uh, they basically need to apply and examine what they have learned from the readings and from the PowerPoints for one specific developing country, uh, like if it's on fiscal policy of, you know, which we covered in class, they need to look at what's the fiscal policy of Tanzania. And we need to look at it based on data, based on readings, and so on and so forth. Uh, so students need to pick one developing country for each research project. Uh, they can use the same uh, country for all the projects, or they can alternate. Uh, it's not really a big deal, so I don't need to go into the details right now. With regards to the homework set, each homework set typically consists of about 10 multiple choice questions, uh, and then five open-ended questions. And they are Relatively easy if you have done the required reading and you have gone through the PowerPoints. It's not really difficult to do it, but if you have not done the PowerPoints or you have not done the readings, then it will be kind of really difficult to answer this. So to some degree, I force them. <laughs> Just you have to do it. If you want to answer the questions, well, and you have not done it, you will probably will not be able to answer it. So it's a kind of brute force to do it, but this is way how I see it too you know, to engage them. Uh, students are welcome to work together on the homework sets, but each student needs to submit her or his own answers via email directly to me. Okay, that's all what I wanted to share at this point. Thank you very much. So let me just move forward to two more things. Okay, yeah, this comes really later. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Carl Spola. Hey, um, uh, embracing the whole uh, talking head on a screen theory, uh, I'm going to play a, a Panopto video um, just to give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, variety in, in how it's presented. Uh, because I come from the Department of Performing Arts, I can also do an interpretive dance if you get bored. <laughs> and so um, um, I teach uh, in the Department of Performing Arts. Uh, the online class I've taught is uh, Perf 220, Reflections of American Society on Stage, where I look at the eight Pulitzer Prize-winning musicals, which conveniently happened one per decade starting in the 1930s up to the present day. And I sort of look at that as a, uh, an entry into understanding American society. So, um, and I'm gonna talk about the here to here this stuff. All right, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of different points. Um, first off, what role does online engagement play in class? And I, I got to say that I think that that online engagement uh, and participation is absolutely crucial, um, not only for the students, um, but I think also for myself as an instructor, uh, as a way of just justifying teaching this course online as opposed to being in, uh, in person. Uh, so I think I think it, it it's absolutely necessary. Um, I think it it prohibits the idea of kind of a detached anonymity, which I think it's very, very easy for it to happen in class. And I think, honestly, being in an online class for the students requires more investment and even more honesty than um, in their face-to-face -face, uh, classes. It's very easy for them to, to become one of the crowd when you have a face-to-face -face class, whereas online, it's very, very obvious when somebody is participating and when somebody is not. And if you don't remember, it's always very easy to go back and look rather than trying to comb back through your, your Swiss cheese memory. Um, I think also that the 
the fact that the class caps for online classes are a little bit smaller, it does tend to make the classes uh, a bit more personal. Everybody engages with everybody else. So I think that's really a positive as well. The things that, that I'm specifically going to talk about are the ways to get students to excel at in, um, engagement. And I think one of the, the key things is to incentivize um, online engagement. And, and that really starts with the grade. Um, let me pull up my syllabus here. Here we have in my evaluation and grading, uh, we see the class participation, um, which I've highlighted there, uh, being a, a substantial part of the grade. And so I think that's really important that if you want them to participate and you want them to engage online, you need to reward them for that participation. And so uh, that's always a part of what it is that I do. I also um, make sure that I have a clear and specific rubric for what I expect in online engagement. And so here you see sort of the breakdown of here is what an A level of, of online engagement or participation is and a B level and a C level and all that sort of stuff. So I think ha having very, very clear expectations of what it is you expect from them and how you're going to grade them. Um, I think it's also important to have painfully detailed and specific instructions about what you expect uh, for on um, their level of engagement. So that's true for the specificity uh, in the syllabus as well as uh, in weekly folders on Blackboard, I am very, very detailed about what it is that I expect in their uh, levels of engagement. I also provide them with a lot of feedback on how they are doing in their, in their online engagement. Uh, and I actually use my TA a lot for this as well, to have him um, go through and figure out sort of moment by moment on this assignment, how did this student do, uh, and to sort of figure that out. Um, I communicate with the students individually two to three times during the online course over the summer that I teach, where I give them an idea of, this is how I feel you are doing so far in your uh, online engagement. Um, and I tend to really follow the rubric very specifically, and uh, a lot of students in their first, kind of a third of the way through assessment, um, are really distressed by sort of the grade that they're getting. And so a lot of them will seek out feedback about how do I improve my online engagement, which is great. Um, I also um, will tend to point out sort of who are the rock stars of the class. And it's very, very obvious if they go and they look at, at the participation that's happening online because it's all there. Um, they can look at sort of these are the students that are doing A-level work. And so it lets them know this is how I need to up my game if, if that's important to me. Um, I also uh, do private Skypes sessions uh, with my students, um, usually at around the midpoint of the semester, which I also find um, really helps them understand um, the connection that I have to them and uh, how it is that they're doing as they move along. I also find it really helpful to talk about how best to engage the class. Uh, I find when they are attempting to engage their fellow students, when they ask each other questions, frequently they will ask them in such a leading way that there is an obvious answer that they are looking for and they're doing a group project or something like that, and they're supposed to provide discussion questions, that they will provide the discussion question, but there's an obvious answer, and so everybody dutifully provides that obvious answer. And so teaching them how to ask questions of each other, how to engage each other in a way that's honestly going to lead to um, substantive discussion, I think is also crucial. Um, then the ultimate way there's, it's getting to the, what are the different modes of engagement? Uh, in in Blackboard, um, there is the discussion board, which for those of you who, who use Blackboard, um, the discussion board is really designed not to discourage discussion. Uh, it doesn't really encourage that at all. I really use the discussion board for more academic formal levels of discussion, where I will post kind of uh, some specific questions and they are required to respond to that. I give them a specific word count, that sort of a thing. And then they're also required to respond to somebody else's uh, response. And so they, uh, they use it in that way. When they do their group um, projects, they also are required to post discussion questions uh, that all of the students are required to, uh, to respond to. Um, we also have, uh, I also use um, a private Facebook group um, for, my, for my class as well. Uh, we use this for a little bit more of informal um, and emotional responses to what's going on, and the students uh, engage with each other. 
They will also um, post uh, introduction videos uh, of themselves uh, at the very beginning of the semester uh, when they do group projects. Um, the paper that they turn into me, they actually do a video pre presentation uh, on that same paper topic where they share their topic with the class. Um, and then the other members of their group will do a video response to each one of their group members. Um, so they get a, an opportunity to be able to see each other, hear each other, and another way of getting the feeling of sort of a, 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 an actual discussion like you would have in class. So I find that very helpful. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so using Blackboard, Facebook, and videos, mostly that are posted either through Facebook or sometimes through YouTube, um, I find those uh, using those platforms easiest for the students and the ones that they are already most comfortable with. And, uh, and so I, I find that, that that tends to be most helpful. So there's a few of my quick thoughts on online engagement, uh, and I look forward to hearing what it is you have to say when we talk to each other right, right now. I totally phoned it in, <laughs> but I still showed up, so I defeated the purpose of phoning it in. So I lastly will focus on um, some of the instructions that others have alluded to, how important that is, and just wanted to provide briefly some context uh, of what I teach. So I teach a course online in the Department of Public Administration and Policy. That's an introductory course to public administration and the policy process. <coughs> Um, there we go. It's moving. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm <laughs> moving it there, but not here. There we go. So this is the course that I'm teaching. Let me check. Um, uh, just to uh, point out that this is a course that's being designed by our DELTAC partnership and is taught not in Blackboard, but in what they call the Engage LMS, which uh, supposedly is more engaging because a little flatter, a little more Facebook-y, um, but really works very similarly to, to Blackboard and at the end of the day. It's an asynchronous course, eight weeks, so we've seen similar kinds of formats so far. I'm not gonna go into details. It's designed to run uh, for up to about 15 students. Uh, a little pushing above that would w work as well. But it's cur it was in its current iteration, it was run with eight. Um, and I do think that for that kind of student engagement that we've mentioned the number of students counts uh, if only for the sanity of the professor and instructor teaching it. Um, it's, inst it's moderated by an instructor ultimately uh, with a course developer uh, in the background. It's also uh, important to notice I think in terms of like the workloads and those kinds of discussions that we haven't raised at all because engagement of course is, is, is time consuming uh, both not only for the students who really get credit for that but uh, the professor, of course, uh, notices very quickly when there's more engagement, there's more work, in a way, to be done. Um, so let's not discount that. Um, the program and course learning objectives do include student engagement as a specific um, goal. I listed them here for you to consider. I will get back to that question, like engagement for what? Um, uh, I think it uh, harks back to what Laura said in the beginning to make sure that there is a purpose to the engagement, the kind of engagement that you choose, including be it in groups or interactive or peer-to-peer -peer or uh, with the materials, et cetera, um, not just for the sake of it. Um, briefly showing here how I count, so you'll see that the actual um, uh, engagement with peers, which I focus on and therefore highlight in bold here, is uh, happening through discussion boards. I have some other engagement, as, um, uh, as, as you earlier pointed out, uh, with materials, with the professors, but that's what, not what I focus on here. Um, and you also see that the weight of the discussion and discussion board contributions is really quite high, at a third higher than uh, uh, some of the other um, elements that I uh, assess. So I wanted to focus on four points that I think um, uh, make it work. Now these are not all my own invention. I just kind of put it together and highlighted it. Some of it also comes from the training I took um, with CTRL, uh, the training I took with um, uh, DELTAC, and some of my own experience. I don't always source it and don't always even remember exactly where it's from. 
Um, so, so bear with me, um, and but realize that that's not just you know it, it's you know it's sort of acquired knowledge, but not all my own. Um, so to the first one, make the uh, context conducive. Uh, conducive um, mm -hmm. is what I meant to say here. Uh, is you know to create a context, and others have alluded to this before that we need to create a context uh, within which students want to and feel safe to engage. Um, so there has to be some meaningful online relationship, some personal background. I'm not the type to make it very personal. It's just not my style. Um, but a student should be able to, if they want to share that they've been on a dog with their walk, uh, on a walk with their dog, or that they, you know, bring in some sort of personal experience. It's not something I expect, but there should be a space and, and safety to do that. Um, but here's some examples that are totally accessible at the very least have photos um, of students. Now they may choose to have a more open or a less open photo, a more formal photo, but at least ha have some, some idea that there's a person behind it. Um, I also run it with something of a course wall or pin wall that looks a little Facebook-y, um, just to, for students to react very quickly, Twitter-like, to something. There's also a blog. Um, one could, and you've mentioned that, use Facebook. I don't personally. I do think that students have to be oriented towards that kind of interaction uh, before they even come to class. So I mentioned that as a contextual um, importance here. Um, and lastly, and I think that's what you mentioned as authentic, um, there has to be a connection to the experience and maybe local happenings of, of students to make their experience um, uh, engaging. You know, um, it, it's, 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 I think it's, it's something that uh, has, you know, kind of goes along with engagement. And then lastly, and importantly, and I up uploaded that uh, just here, uh, it's not meant to be seen, but you can find it uh, as our old presentations on the Blackboard site, ATSC, the, the Anne Fair and Blackboard site. Um, I think you need to give students some sort of netiquette. Um, what is it? It's got to do with instructions and what expectations you have towards them in terms of word count, voice, etc. But the netiquette is more a general thrust of, of what to do and not to do online. And even if you think it's obvious to them, I think just having it spelled out very clearly of things that, you know, that, that are not acceptable, and then also, you know, bearing down on that if it does happen is, is really very important. To the second point, um, to have specific instructions, I think that's all, all of us have alluded to the fact that if you expect online engagement, um, uh, in, in, in engagement in general, but I think online engagement is even more so because so much of it happens through keyboards, the questions have to be very clear and answerable. So there has to be a, a lot of instruction uh, surrounding what you do. Uh, and you have to put work, as you mentioned, and, and thought into, you know, what is answerable, what is clear. And I stumbled over that, you know, having too vague a question, too long, um, things that don't really um, uh, uh, resonate or aren't clear, aren't engaging for them to answer. So it really, there needs to be a lot of not too much leading, but also not too much like, oh, just anything goes, uh, going into it. And then the instructions also need to be, uh, include instructions about length, frequency, voice, tone. Um, uh, for example, are you supposed to be more academic, you know, including sources, etc., or is it more meant to, you know, exchange experiences? I'd be very explicit about that. Um, the thrust of the discussion, you know, which direction you want it to head, possibly giving examples. There really needs to be a lot more guidance than in the, you know, on the face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, if needed, one has to provide instructions with specific question, um, uh, with, each, with each specific question, like answer one of those, um, provide one example, or first discuss pros, then discuss cons. So having general inc instructions about you know, how you engage in the uh, discussion boards is one thing, but then also having specific instructions, um, manageable and meaningful instructions that go along with each one of the questions. Provide and stick to the grading rubric. Um, uh, even if you feel like halfway through, uh, wait a second, I should have recrafted this, it's probably not the time to change it. Uh, but it's really important to have a grading rubric. In fact, I should upload the one I have just to give you an idea. There's some online also. A grading rubric really is a matrix where you basically say, I'm going to grade in my case, um, uh, in my case it's I grade the quality expression uh, aspect I grade relevance and I grade impact. Do others respond? 
Um, and then, uh, so those are the, the three chunks of criteria. All of them are weighed the same way, um, uh, telling them whether there is this outstanding, very good, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory. And I give points, so if you have an outstanding quality expression, outstanding relevance, outstanding on impact, you get a number of points the same way that um, uh, Bernard, I think, uh, uh, expressed it. In my case, it's maximum of 12.5 points, and they all add up throughout the semester. But you have to be extremely, extremely explicit, um, and, and, and it doesn't really work without being as explicit as that, although I would love to be less explicit. <laughs> um, so the third point and second to last, um, uh, well actually here's just to give you an example, uh, a discussion that I think in the end, just to you know, kind of show you both sides, was very specific, but I thereafter learned that maybe not to give them three different points to answer. Um, it, it did work in the sense that I then broke out uh, each one of those questions. Um, so it's a movie that they had to discuss and apply some of the public administration concepts to. Uh, I could have, uh, and, and afterwards did, break them out into different groups to discuss any one, not all, uh, of those specific questions. And you'll see that they were actually, um, um, if you look a little closer and you're able to enlarge this, you'll see that the questions I gave them are very specific, really saying in quotation marks, here's the, what the book says, how does it apply to this particular case and what would you um, uh, point to um, in, in that application. Lastly, um, deliver deliberate feedback. Um, so very explicit and deliberate feedback is something that others have mentioned before as well. That's very important. And I mean, it, it's, it's hard to really stick to that, but it's, it's almost a necessity to do that very immediately. Um, so you have to really in front invest in the rubrics, in ideally clickable rubric, rubrics, and I know Blackboard also offers that, so that you can provide that feedback in your sleep very easily. It doesn't have to be on a Sunday. I really try not to do it on a Sunday. But, but to be very immediate. So it, it needs a lot more front investment to craft all of this and then go through it very quickly. Turn it in. I use a lot um, on campus to grade papers and have the rubric, upload it, and just go click, 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 click. And students uh, buy that. Uh, if they get it two weeks later, which I often do, they don't buy it. Click, 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 click. They expect a lot more explanations then. Um, so, so being quick uh, allows you to also be a little cheap um, mm -hmm. But deliberate uh, is, is the emphasis here. So provide explicit feedback directly, uh, if necessary, privately, uh, but also indirectly by engaging in the class yourself so that you can uh, model and point to um, what is expected. Um, so re using reply all, uh, uh, answering the, whole, the entire class can be used to further discussion, to wrap it up. Um, uh, however, even as an instructor, and I have to say, this for myself, it's very easy to get off track. Like, I, I like what they say, and, and I find myself typing like all kinds of different things and say, wait a second, that wasn't the question I asked them, so let me not get <laughs> delete into that. So also as an instructor to really um, uh, remember that what you, you know, to, to prod them in the correct direction, not let yourself be thrown off. Um, uh, point to model best practices. I sometimes call students out by name. Um, again, faces and photos for that is important. Um, we mentioned, others mentioned the high order insight, so let me not go um, into this uh, too much. I did want to point to the last one here. As classes get bigger, it's unrealistic to respond meaningfully to individual and student contributions, so have a game plan for that. So uh, rather than just tapering off your engagement in the class because it becomes unmanageable, um, have a policy and tell them about it. Like, I will respond to each one of your posts. Or, or journal entries or whatever, um, uh, the first week of class, so you have guidance, but you will not see me do that for the rest of the class um, because it just is not feasible to do so. Um, and then what has been said before in terms of instructions here, um, but I wanted to repeat it because it, it, it isn't usually important under this heading, match up and apply rewards. Um, if meaningful discussion and engagement is expected of students, it has to count for something. You said that too. Um, I've tried it in any other way. It does not work. And I think it's because we count other things. If we didn't, if we were in a context where we said, you know, there is no things that you have to turn in. I'm just going to give you a grade or some qualitative grade at the end of the, at the, end of 
the semester, maybe then it wouldn't be like that. But because we count other things, this too has to be counted. So it's in the logic of things. Uh, find a manageable and easy system, um, setting up points, uh, having clickable uh, matrices and rubrics is really important. Um, uh, you know, more points granted for maybe units that actually do ask for more discussion. Uh, it, of course, not all is about grades. There's also some uh, element of recognition, so play on that, but that it definitely cannot be um, the sole fo foundation. So lastly, uh, some in questions and, uh, uh, you know, lessons that I learned. Um, it, it, engagement is deeper and more focused than uh, in class. I do think that I've experienced that uh, online there is more deeper interaction, um, uh, it's more focused, more involved interaction and engagement and also often more um, informed engagement. Like they will go back, if you ask them to and you reward it, they will go back and actually look at page numbers and cite things, etc. It's a lot less um, uh, superficial, if you like, than in the classroom. Um, but, you know, it's also to be said that there may be then less higher order thinking because there's less time, so a lot of investment spent to answering questions and less time to think beyond those questions. Um, I have asked myself what rules apply to students versus professors. Am I then to go and you know, put page numbers and quote things very directly? So I often keep my answers clearly shorter than the students, um, uh, you know, just to make sure that they understand I'm not like them answering, I'm guiding them. I'm monitoring uh, them and mentoring them. Um, how to keep it manageable for me is still a very open question. I think there just has to have, you have to be able to kind of set, set it into a rhythm. I think you saw some models here how to do that with particular days and by when to expect things, make it foreseeable, um, uh, but also really assess your own capabilities and your own time management. Um, that you have available and invested in a strategic way. What with increasing class sizes I'm asking here, we are sometimes pushed to accept more students online into sections than what they're designed for. You can make breakout groups, et cetera, but the fact is that you, at the tail end, you still have to look at all of them. Um, you make it manageable for students, but not necessarily for the instructor. And lastly, I wanted to just um, reiterate the purpose. Um, student engagement for what? Um, I think uh, I have, convinced myself that it's important in this course uh, for various reasons I don't need to go into here in detail. Um, but there may also be courses that don't need that as much. I may think maybe we're ideologically a little focused because we are in this liberal arts kind of setting um, that everything needs to happen interactively and be discussed. There may be courses that, and sessions of courses that could be very sort of, you know, consuming um, uh, or engaging with the material. Uh, more than with everybody else. So, so we have to be honest and wonder, you know, is all of this necessary um, and, 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 and invest it more strategically? Terrific. Would you you guys are like all open, convinced. Open we have yeah. for sure 10 minutes, if not, you know, pushing it too much. I have a question. So how do you know the difference between engagement and activity? Like once these assignments get so small, it's just a matter of checking boxes in some cases. And I'm, I'm curious about the word engagement would suggest that there's positive change in the learning of the student. Um, so how do you sort of um, avoid just activity being counted toward a grade as opposed to progress? Does that make sense? Do you want to cheat? Sure. It sounds like him. Well, um, I would see, I would wonder what the, what the goal is of the either activity or discussion or whatever you'd like on, on that end. Not get too bogged down in what you're defining in specific terms. And just make sure that what the students are asked to fulfill meets whatever criteria you're, you're, you're judging your course and their ability to do so on. So if an activity like you're learning how to change the oil in a car, that doesn't necessarily have to be critiqued by peers or have a discussion board post about changing oil in the car, but making it in a way that they're engaged with actually doing it themselves or producing a video of a lesson that they're creating to teach others how to do it, then I think that that would be a successful assignment. And that you'll find in um, maybe some mid-semester evaluations, which is something you can ask and, and get their feedback on if they enjoy the, the course content and what feedback they have for you. 
I think it's really important you put the finger on an important question in terms of like discussions. If you say, oh, discussion boards are a place where engagement happens, to refrain from using discussion boards to just sort of check knowledge um, and say, oh, have you done your activity? So um, I, I, we've tried to find other ways to check that they've done their activities. You know, like, have you read the chapter? That's not engagement yet. That's, I've done it. But the engagement based on that chapter that you've read comes afterwards. So I, I w I'm, I'm trying to be very careful to move only the things that really are engagement, and not only that, things are, that require engagement with other peers or myself um, into discussion boards. If I want to check other things, I'm trying to see that, that there is an indirect way to check that they've done it, like a test or something, or a checklist, or, uh, or use, I have also a course journal that Blackboard inspired me to use for them to take notes. Um, uh, just to check that they've actually done an activity. So to really kind of try at least to separate those, those two things. There's also um, different tools within Blackboard now. There's a five-star rating system. There's also like likes in Facebook or other uh, tools that you may use. Or you could do something completely authentic, like if one of your uh, projects in history class is looking at monuments. You can have them write a Yelp review on the monument and actually get people on the outside engaging with their posts. So it just depends on how willing you are to be creative in your pre-work and setting up the thing so that they can have an engaging experience themselves. I mean, I think you need to talk about, uh, you need to think about for yourself, for each class, um, what it is you, what your expectations are for engagement, what the engagement means for that class. I think you need to communicate that clearly to the, the class so that they understand sort of what that in, that level of engagement is. I mean, for me, when I think about <clears throat> that level of engagement, it's about how you are how you are moving beyond, yes, here's the information that we've looked at, here's what we've read, um, here's what others have said about it, um, but how do you then synthesize that information from what it is we have, all the different things we've talked about, how do you put that together, how do you challenge it, how do you challenge each other and question the assumptions that people have. It's moving beyond um, sort of the, the, this is the information that we've studied to now wh how are you going to apply that and how are you going to think about that? I mean, to me, that's how I use the, the online participation or engagement section of it. Sure. Um, so I think it was Bernard was saying that um, Blackboard is, Blackboard Discussion Board is designed to discourage discussion. That's me. Oh, was that yeah. you? Sorry. <laughs> um, which I totally agree with, and I'm wondering if any of you guys have tips for other softwares besides Facebook, because they just have a knee-jerk reaction against it, um, where discussion, because I hate grading the discussions, I just hate everything about that discussion board, and yet discussion board, it's important in an online context in which you don't have synchronous time. Not necessarily. I mean, I play, I play double lag. What, what course do you teach? Um, I teach uh, Global Public Health as a summer course. Okay. So what do you usually have students talk about in your, in your class? Um, Usually we have them respond to various readings um, and then respond to each other, sort of linking them to what's going on in current events and then linking back to, um, to the readings that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I feel like it's an important thing for them to do because they don't actually get to talk to each other about it. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I just despise the platform. Even the new format? Have I you, have you seen the new format? I think I think I think it does it oh, does work okay. better. Okay. But somebody had an answer there. Yeah, Ian, would you like to share? Yeah, Yaza. Yaza. Um, it's uh, man, it, it's still a discussion board, but it seems to be a lot more easily accessible. Okay. You know, like you sort of you, you can sort of uh, two things about it. One and it's in Blackboard. Huh? Yeah, you, you, there's connection to it in, in our Blackboard oh, system. Cool. Okay. And each course you can that. sign up and students can sign up. But a couple things about it that are very cool. One is it updates live. So if you're like doing something and other students are updating, you can see it happening live. Oh, cool. yeah. um, and it's and they also have tags. So if there are things that are related to other posts, there are ways of tagging other posts. Oh, yeah. And I found it, it's been really successful. Okay. Plus they also do polls. You can do polls in the same system that you're doing this doing the posts. Gotcha. So I've I've been using that. I'll give that a try. What's so it called? Uh, Piazza. It's right. Piazza. Piazza. Oops. What about what here, so this is what Piazza looks like. It's like, uh, here's a question. You know, here's a here's a quiz. Track what each person does. You just use what platform? Well, I actually have from 
College okay. Park. So I mean, we're using some really different okay. price. Um, yeah, but I'm sure they have it. In, they might have it in Blackboard now. Okay. Okay. I don't think they have it in Blackboard. Mm -hmm. okay. This is, okay. this is Piazza with them Blackboard. Oh, this is Piazza, okay. Mm -hmm. But students have to enroll. Uh, you have to create the Piazza session, unlike the existing discussion board, which is part of a Blackboard class. You have it's to go through easy. one extra step, but it's super easy, and Blackboard can help you with it over the phone. And do so students have to do any step? No. Oh. Yeah, they have to press a button. Piazza button. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's acceptable. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's possible that with the Blackboard updates, it's going to be better. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I just have that Piazza link. Piazza was not right as closely <coughs> okay. So this is, this is the, the new Blackboard site. Gotcha. Um, here what the discussion boards look like. Okay. But you still have to walk into each one. And an uh, idea, if you guys want to like, have them automatically spread out, is do select all and collect. And it will make everything pop up there. So you can grade them. Okay. And then, you know, hit reply. And you can just reply below. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. How many people are in your class? For four There's small classes, about 10 people. Yeah. Do you want more? Yeah. I think Flashlight does this too, but it's really easy to create groups on Piazza. So, for example, if they're mm -hmm. doing group projects, you just want to be able to talk to them that way. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can just do it through messaging. You I need to exploring for this summer doing an office hours link on Piazza so they can ask public office hour questions. Okay. Can Jill? I say something provocative and heretical? <laughs> Not at 3.30? I think it's going to be a pushback against online learning at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people are pushing back just to the web with what's happening with losing your passwords and everything like that. And I think the fact that we are rewarding students by upping participation is a sign that we are not engaging them. In fact, they sh we should be building a learning community where we don't have to sort of reward them extra for being a part of the class. And this has been something that's been going on with distance learning in correspondence courses, radio, television. But I think there might be a next generation where we can start to turn that around, like you said, uh, uh, talk about walking your dog. Put on Google Glasses while you're walking the dog and have an experience other people can join in on. And I know it's a little passe, but Second Life, remember that? Where people actually came to a classroom, and I know Blackboard now has avatars. I think people are going to get to a point where we've exhausted this model of distance learning and look for something else. I mean, think about all the MOOCs that are coming up and the popular exams where people are watching you the whole time. I think there's going to be a big reaction, and there's got to be a next generation. I think we need to start getting ready for it, thinking about it. And I think that's a great area to um, talk about diversity, too, is because we each have our own diverse experiences, and to maybe set up your course content so that it is authentic, where you're taking those interests into consideration and allowing your students to share them with the rest of their classmates and teach one another what their life is like, what their response to the course content is like, is also pretty important. And I really like the assignment about a developing country, um, because students can actually share why they care about that country and what that means and what learning about that country means to them in particular and hopefully spark some inspiration in their in their peers. I have uh, another technology related question that uh, d does any of you or has uh, do we know of a of a way that we could do voice to voice discussion in this environment rather than relying on text Skype? Skype. Well, it, it, but and do, are we using it? I guess is my question. Uh, in a course. A okay. uh, telephone. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, no, no, it, it, uh, to provide a forum, a venue for a discussion the, of the group. Well, we we have used, yeah, it, Collaborate is built in, like Piazza is built into Blackboard, and I've used that, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. It works quite well. I've used it actually also to invite guest speakers uh, that way. Uh, it was easier, it was for a federal government employee, it was easier because Collaborate didn't require him to install any software in his computer, so it was easier for him to come into class using Collaborate, um, uh, along with yet another student who was online. So that's, I find that pretty well, uh, pretty well done. Um, the Engage platform that Deltac is offering does, uh, interacts with Adobe Connect, 
which I believe we're trying to get to AU somehow or is floating in various formats, which is very similar. Um, I found that easier to use, but both are actually pretty straightforward uh, where you could lecture, you could sh share your screen a little bit like he just did, but in real time. Um, and uh, but also meet with students individually. So I, I think that's, I like that everything's in Blackboard as much as I don't quite like Blackboard as much as I would like it to like. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, but it, it, it's really nice to have it in one in the same place and to use the tools that are in there. There's always better tools out there, but having them in one place is, is, is really valuable. And, and uh, how about, just to, to elaborate just a little bit more, this is, uh, is there a student to student discussion as well? Audible. Yeah. Uh, I think it's up to six people. Up to six people can have video, but then a hundred can have uh, audio or tune into it. The, the video in generally crashes. Right. I, I think that's yeah. just something that's a part of. We we expect more of technology than I think it is to able to deliver. Yeah, and uh, video also, is, is really difficult to run. There's also a tool being piloted by the languages department if you want to get in touch with Gorky Cruz, Cruz at American.edu, using VoiceThread, which has, um, you can upload any media, that's image, uh, movie, sound, recording, anything, and then students can comment with any media. That's, so you can comment on a picture with your voice, you can comment on a, on a movie with your, with typing, uh, with another image. So that's definitely a, a really cool tool that you can get on. On that. Sure. Yeah, um, I'm sort of interested in the idea of student created videos. This is this like discussion or assignment. There's a couple of things. One, is it at this point that students, when they get to college now, they pretty much know how to do it and there's not much you have to worry about? Or is there a lot of work on our part to say, okay, this is how you do it? Uh, uh, at least what I have found is that they, they, they students all students know how to do that right. far better than I do. Um, and so, I have not had not run into yet a student who has needed help in doing that. Um, Do you give guidelines to how long uh, their video should mm -hmm. be? Uh, Do you give guidelines as to whether it's supposed to be a headshot or some other content? Uh, sometimes I do. Um, um, most of the time, I will give them sort of parameters on sort of the this is sort of the content and kind of the the quantity. Um, uh, that you should be presenting. I sort of allow them to present that, in, and I've had some way really creative, interesting presentations that weren't just them showing their head talking, interpretive but dance. the interpretive dance, um, which is an underutilized element <laughs> of online learning. And so I, I think, and so I, I've seen people um, sort of turn that camera around and take in the world, um, and and sort of looking through different interesting lenses, which I think. Um, I wouldn't have thought of, and I would hate to dictate, this is how you need to do it. We, we um, should probably wrap it up here because there's another actually also connected to this, uh, innovative examples from online teaching happening in here in eight minutes. So enough time for, I don't know, there's no coffee here, but sort of around here. So we will certainly, I, I will stick around. I hope some of you will stick around here. So if you have more questions, just approach us while we wrap up and make sure that the next group has uh, everything available. Thank you. Thank you.